last time she was here. It's called uh, Jim Valley. Gilligan, Michael. Jim Gilligan is an old uh, mass metal grad and is now doing various other things. And his uh, uh, pathway to fame is from a very thoughtful book on violence that we commend you. And the chapter that I sent out to everybody Turn in the program uh, is um, um, very powerful. Uh, those of you who somehow didn't check your emails, Michael's finished with that. So we don't putting them in the middle of the table for late late arrivals who didn't get the message. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Uh, last time I was incredibly obliged to speak to such an eminent group of thinkers and scholars, and some of whom I have admired from a distance before uh, for decades before meeting you, and you have welcomed me with great indulgence. So I return today mainly to learn from you, as well as my mentor and colleague, Dr. James Gilligan, uh, whom you know almost like a family member. Uh, the title of this talk is the main question I have. Do we surrender our moral compass to technical rule? Expounding further, given our professional responsibility to society, if we see dangers to public health and well-being, should we refrain from speaking up in professional ways because of a technical rule? I wonder how many mental health professionals would have spoken up if the American Psychiatric Association had not emphatically instructed that we fall in line with the Goldwater Rule, including making public statements about me, uh, who am not even a member. My suspicion is many more. How much did the public expect to hear from experts about the president before it was told psychiatrists had no role? I've learned over time that they expected as much as official public statements. As citizens, do we not have an obligation to share the special knowledge we have acquired through our privileged place in society? Is expertise to be used to enlighten and empower, or uh, to exclude and oppress, as I believe the APA is helping this administration to do? As for the First Amendment, is it not specifically intended to prevent tyranny? What is more, help what is more helpful to tyranny than the control of awareness by imposing silence and in the process depriving the people of critically relevant information. Do we not have faith in the usefulness of psychiatric knowledge and the, the benefits of our clinical experience? The first half of the Goldwater Rule that encourages education of the public tends to be ignored. Even where we are to refrain from diagnosing public figures, the rule is subordinate to the overarching principle that we contribute to the betterment of public health. How do we reconcile a clear, legally binding duty to protect our patients, but no duty to protect society, and only an obligation to protect the privacy of a public figure who is not even a patient? How seriously should we take our responsibility to society, as outlined in the Code of Medical Ethics, that says that our primary duty is to patients as well as to society. Uh, and as outlined in the code, uh, the Declaration of Geneva, that gives us a humanitarian mandate. And ought we to take moral agency out of ethical considerations, as a new interpretation of the Goldwater Rule attempts to do? These are my questions. And I now turn it over to Jim. Before that, I wonder if I could just make a mention. Apparently, a lot of people didn't get what I emailed out, and I'm very disturbed by that. But uh, one of the critical points I, that I hope you'll take away is that both uh, Jim and Bandy have avoided uh, being uh, sandbagged by the Goldwater Rule by carefully steering away from mental illness and diagnosis, that they emphasize the dangerousness of human behavior which as citizens, as long as you're speaking as a citizen, as citizens, uh, you are certainly allowed to comment on. And uh, Jim's uh, chapter gives a very sequentially, carefully reasoned uh, analysis of why behavior should be an issue rather than diagnosis. Tom, just as a technical point, 
Uh, Andy has no risk from the Goldwater rule because she's not a member of the APA. Okay. Uh, people who uh, voice positions which are viewed as unethical uh, by the APA in the public forum, uh, you know, are subject to being uh, criticized uh, by the APA. But uh, Bandy has zero uh, risk from the Goldwater rule, which I believe she alluded to a few minutes ago. So it's not an operative thing for her. Okay, but again, the question would be, we can also think about going beyond that. Correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, applicable only to members. Right. And so. yet I do respect the American Psychiatric Association as a purveyor of uh, professional guidelines of ethics. And, um, and I do look to it for some level of ethical authority. Uh, we'd be glad to know that. Well, I'll, let me jump in right on, on these okay. issues. Uh, I thought I... I begin by emphasizing what I do mention in this the chapter I wrote for the book that Bandy edited on the dangerous case of Donald Trump. Oh, the one thing I'd want to start by emphasizing is Tom also said uh, that I'm not interested in labeling Trump with any particular psychiatric diagnosis for many reasons, uh, and quite independent of the Goldwater rule. One reason is because mental illness alone doesn't necessarily make him or any other political leader either dangerous or unfit for office. Uh, both Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill uh, have been widely documented as suffering from severe depression, and Churchill was, of course, well-known chronic alcoholic. Uh, another reason is that mental illness and dangerousness are only slightly correlated, that is, most mentally ill people uh, never commit a serious act of violence. And most violent people are not diagnosed as having a major mental illness. Uh, for example, I've read that only about 1% of uh, people uh, who've committed murders are found to be not guilty by reason of insanity. It's really the exception, the rare exception that proves the rule. So there's only a slight correlation between mental illness and dangerousness. Uh, the second thing I'd want to say is that most psychiatrists, you know, really focus on clinical psychiatry and mental illness. I mean, their job is to treat individuals, diagnose them, treat them for their uh, individual case. That's called clinical psychiatry. But it seems to me that psychiatry also is a branch of public health and preventive medicine, or preventive psychiatry. And to the extent that we also, uh, I think, uh, are in that role, we have a duty not just to individual patients, we have a duty to, to society, the same way that uh, a public health professional would have a duty you know, to diagnose a, a flu epidemic and do what we could to kind of stop, regardless of what, what particular individual has it. A third thing I've mentioned is that in assessing dangerousness, that's quite different from diagnosing mental illness. I mean, I've spent my career really studying violence, the causes and prevention of violence, trying to learn everything I could about it. And um, regardless of whether or not the person committing it is mentally ill or not. In other words, I ran the mental health programs for the Massachusetts prison system for many years, and then Bandy and I together did a, a, a violence prevention experiment in the San Francisco jails. All of these were quite really independent of whether somebody was mentally ill or not. We were interested in preventing suicide, homicide, riots, hostage-taking incidents, uh, mass rapes, arson, you know, I mean, all the kinds of violence that may or may not be associated <coughs> with mental illness. So I'm approaching this question about Trump, not primarily from the standpoint of kind of conventional mainstream psychiatry, is he mentally ill or not, and if so, what's the diagnosis, uh, but is he dangerous? In terms of mental illness, I think that if you took many of the public statements that Trump has made uh, at face value and you line them up with the criteria for different mental disorders in DSM-5, you could say that he you know, 
if we were creating a differential diagnosis of the potential diagnosis we'd want to rule out if we were to examine him publicly, I could come up with eight or ten, you know, differential diagnoses. But that's very different from giving him a diagnosis. I mean, that's what you would do if you actually examined him in your office uh, and, and had all kinds of studies. But that's not what I'm interested in doing. I don't think it's relevant. Uh, I've really studied dangerousness, for which I mean the liability of a person to increase the rate of violence in a society from, from looking at it from a public health standpoint. Um, now, we know that most politicians who I think we can easily say are dangerous or have been dangerous, didn't necessarily kill anybody themselves. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure that Hitler ever killed anybody or Stalin. They may have, a few individuals. But we think of them as some of the most dangerous people in history because they were responsible for the murder of tens of millions of people. But not done by them, but done by their followers. And uh, now, I'm not saying Trump is Hitler or Stalin. Obviously, he's not. But what I am saying is the general point about uh, a politician, he can be, if, if I speak of Trump as being dangerous, I'm not saying like he himself is likely to do what he mentioned he could do, which is walk out on Fifth Avenue and murder somebody, you know, which, as he said, he could do without losing a single vote. I'm not saying that that is what he's likely to do. I don't, at least I have no reason to say it. But that has little or nothing to do with whether he's dangerous. Uh, my point is that he, like many politicians, incites his followers to be dangerous. He boasts, he actually boasts about what I think it would be hard to say were not uh, violations of the law if they were prosecuted by the law. When he talked about grabbing women by their genitals, whether or not they, you know, uh, agreed to that. Uh, but we do know that he's incited his followers to violence. I give multiple examples in the chapter I wrote in the book, so I'm not going to take the time to run through all of them. But I think you, if you followed him, it's hard not to to know things that Trump did, it's all over the, the newspapers. Um, and my point is that from the standpoint of preventing violence and preventing dangerousness, it is much more important for us to take the point of view of public health and preventive medicine than to get hung up on, on the issue of clinical psychiatry. If Trump himself, um, uh, mentally, Ill, mentally ill, or which diagnosis does he have? One thing I could mention is that we know that he tells untruths by the thousands. Uh, and we know that not just because of fact checkers in the media, you know, whom Trump dismisses as fake news, but also just from what Trump himself says. Because he has repeatedly, time after time, actually contradicted himself. I mean, he said one thing one day and the opposite the next. I did this, I did not do it, and so forth. Now, so clearly, just from Trump's own mouth, I think we can conclude that, that he's been telling untruths, just as I said, not by the score, but by the thousands. Uh, now, that gives us two possibilities, it would seem to me. Either he believes the untruths that he's saying, in which case, I think we have to say he's out of touch with reality, by definition, uh, which would be consistent with delusions or psychosis or that he knows that what he's saying is untrue, which would be uh, a symptom of what the sometimes called psychopathic, being a psychopathic liar. That is somebody who just constantly tells an untruth in order to manipulate people for his own advantage. Uh, so I think you could say there's a, a kind of implicit um, assumption that he's either delusional or, uh, or a psychopathic liar, I think the, my own guess is the likelihood is more like probably the latter than the former. I think he's more likely a, a, just a manipulative psychopath than, a, than, a, uh, than delusional. On the other hand, it doesn't even matter. What I'm saying is that the question isn't so much whether Donald Trump the person is dangerous, it's whether what he says and does is dangerous. He says things to his followers, beat up 
people who protest against me. Uh, so badly they'll have to be taken out on, on a stretcher. Uh, I promise I'll pay your, your legal bills. And when they did that, and actually some of his followers then were tried for assault and battery because they had beaten up people so badly. Uh, Trump's only complaint was that they weren't violent enough yet. He said in the past they would, would have done more. Um, and, uh, and so on. Of course, that, uh, when I wrote my chapter, it was before the Charlottesville, Virginia incident where neo-Nazis and other Trump supporters um, drove a, one of them drove a truck through an audience of pedestrians, as you all know, uh, killing one woman and seriously injuring us, uh, one or two dozen other people. Trump's, again, you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with his response to that, which was that this, uh, um, you know, there were good people and bad people on both sides, kind of creating a moral equivalency between these, uh, you know, between this murderer and the protesters who were quite nonviolent, certainly not even approaching that comparison. So I, I'm, um, I, I outlined my whole position more closely just in, in the chapter in Bandy's book. But I just want to mention these are some of the things that I'm involved with. I don't feel that uh, I'm really, what can I say, either violating the Goldwater Rule or constrained by it. Uh, I think that I'm really talking not about is Trump mentally ill. I'm talking about is he dangerous, and is he dangerous indirectly through his effects on, on his followers and the words he uses. Uh, and I'm not trying to understand his words from the standpoint of what is going on in his mind when he utters them. That's not really the question from a public health standpoint. What the, the question is, what effect does that have on people who listen to those words? And we've seen what the effect is. You know, it's, sometimes it's murder. There are some things that Trump has said that, I mean, you don't have to be a psychiatrist to, to understand what he's saying. Everybody knows that he reminded his followers that they could always assassinate Hillary Clinton if they wanted to. He said that when he said that uh, if she came into power, uh, well, you know, I don't know what the judges could do. Maybe the Second Amendment folks. I don't know. I mean, he, I, I made the analogy here to the way Henry II got his knights to kill Thomas, uh, uh, account for what his name Beckett. Beckett. Thomas Beckett, uh, and uh, that Trump is doing the same thing. Uh, not saying directly, go out and kill this person, but saying, you know, why are people allowing this person to still be alive? I, I think Trump, in, in his indirect way, was playing Henry II. To me, that's a sign of dangerousness. Uh, I don't think I'm misusing psychiatric terminology. Because after all, dangerousness is not a mental disorder. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, a description of behavior. All I'm trying to do is saying, I've spent you know, 50 years closely observing the most dangerous people our society produces. And I hear that same language in Trump. Uh, many people have pointed out that he uses the language of the mafia. Somebody who testifies against him is a rat and ratting him out. I heard that in the prisons. That was. You know, you would get killed in a prison if you ratted on, on one of your fellow inmates or on somebody in the community. Uh, Trump is, is using the language of the mafia, he's using the language of dictators. Uh, it's clear that the political leaders whom he is holding up as his ideals and role models are multiple murderers. Putin, Kim Jong-un, uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, I, became, I could go through the list. Um, my sense is that, uh, let's say one, one last thing. I, I know there's a great risk, which it's important not to you know, fall into. It's almost impossible to talk about somebody you disapprove of politically. Well, at some point, somebody, again, raising the question of Hitler. Well, I mean, that's too easy, because nobody, you know, is really comparable. Um, but I do want to at least 
acknowledge some analogies that I think are going on in our society now. I quoted in this in my chapter uh, the, the, the great German sociologist Max Weber, who wrote a wonderful uh, piece uh, about uh, politics as a vocation. And one thing he said was he thought that he and other professors really should not make any direct comments about a political party or leader. They can talk about politics in general, in the abstract, but they, they should not try to, I think he was afraid they would uh, uh, kind of be persuading their students who to vote for. But I've always been bothered by his saying that because it seemed to me that it may have discouraged many of the leading intellectuals of Germany during the Weimar Republic from speaking out publicly against Hitler when he was, you know, clearly giving all kinds of evidence of being dangerous. Um, what I'm saying is I don't think the German Psychiatric Association in the 1930s uh, deserves any credit for having remained silent as Hitler came to power. You don't have to be Hitler, though, to be dangerous. You don't have to be Hitler for the same principle to apply. I'm, I'm just saying that, I mean, you know, Hitler's an example because it's so extreme. Uh, and Trump is, has, certainly has not done anything comparable to that yet. All I'm saying is I think it's important to intervene so that we don't wind up wondering what happened. You know, Hitler, after the burning of the Reichstag, declared martial law. Trump has just declared a national emergency. Well, we have a stronger democracy than the Weimar Republic did. But the, the parallels are just, you know, they're so manifest. But I think it's important for us to try to remind people of this. Uh, I, I, I say one more thing, then I'm going to shut up so people can, can, can talk. I do sympathize with the Trump rule, the Trump, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Goldwater rule. Because I do remember that one of the psychiatrists who was quoted in the magazine at the time said that uh, Barry Goldwater was schizophrenic. Well, I think this was, I thought, really inappropriate and uncalled for. I mean, it was a huge mistake. I mean, we shouldn't be going around flinging around terms like schizophrenia. I think you could, I think Goldwater was dangerous in many ways, but I think there's no evidence that he was schizophrenic. I mean, look at the rest of his life. Um, so I do think the American Psychiatric Association did have, you know, good reason to say, look, be careful, folks. Don't just throw these psychiatric diagnoses around. If you disagree with somebody politically, say that, but, you know, but you're not speaking as a psychiatrist if you do that. Um, so what I'm saying is, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to be very careful about not throwing psychiatric diagnoses around loosely. But I think, you know, I, I really have made deep studies of dangerousness and violence. And I really think that uh, I can back up anything I'm saying about, about Trump as somebody who's dangerous, regardless of what's going on, you know, in, in, in his private mind. We, we have enough data just from seeing what he has said and done publicly. Okay, anyway, that's my point of view. And I, I realize people can have other opinions, reasonably. There's just two fast points. One is that, um, Dante pointed out that the hottest places in hell were reserved for those who remain neutral in a time of crisis. Uh, excellent. So you have historical precedent. On excellent. The side. Second point, of, uh, well, two related points. One is that there apparently is uh, has been reported as the view of Trump followers that uh, they uh, have simply discounted what he says. Uh, hmm. He's not going to do that. He's just trying to piss off the Democrats or trying to you know, uh, provoke the liberals and so forth. So there's a kind of double think. Yeah. In the, uh, in the, I guess it's, uh, I don't care remember, it's Animal Farm or... Uh, or, or 1994. 1984. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, or Tillich. But the point being uh, that uh, they have a, a way of managing the situation where other people are saying, what the hell is he going on? And they're saying, oh, he's just trying to you know, make, uh, make waves. And uh, finally, um, I can't remember where I saw this recently, but apparently, um, and this says, it is a very political statement to be making, I, I apologize for it in advance, that hate crimes go up in Republican administrations. Did so in the Bush administration, is doing now to an unprecedented degree. And it's the old notion that we've had discussions about here of the moral atmosphere being established from the top. 
-hmm. and that license to be bigoted yeah. uh, can trickle down uh, much more than economy. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's, that's what I wanted to suggest with people's thoughts. Thank you. Let me uh, make a couple of comments if I, I might. I also want to say I, I think I'm the only person in the room who's ever adjudicated enforcement of the Goldwater Rule. So uh, uh, the APA would not object to your uh, saying that toxic speech or unconscionable speech can have effects, uh, though it's hardly part of the psychiatric armament armamentarium. So when we say uh, this individual is delusional, and, and I'm not yeah. uh, Trump, but just I'm going to make this up, mm -hmm. a schizophrenic uh, who's actively delusional and who is drinking, it is a part of settled science to say that that person's risk has been dramatically increased. It's been increased over what the alcohol would do alone and over what the schizophrenia would do alone. Mm -hmm. And that would be unarguable. Uh, Bandy and others in her group have made the case that this president is unfit for duty, uh, that he's incapable of serving. And though I personally have enormously strong negative feelings about that, this individual. I have critical opinions about making that assertion because I do a lot of fitness for duty evaluations and you don't do them from a distance. You do them after an examination and no examination has been performed. And I think it is reckless to assert somebody is or is not fit absent having done that rig rigorous examination. I also think referring to this as a technical rule is disingenuous. The Goldwater Rule is an ethical rule. It's been alive and well since it was approved around 1970. Uh, it has not uh, been restated uh, because of the election of Donald Trump. The rule, the uh, wording of the rule has remained exactly the same and has referred to making a professional opinion. So in a public setting, were you to say, this guy is either delusional or psychopathic, the APA would reasonably challenge that assertion as being unethical. And they would say, in nicer words, how the hell would you know? Uh, for you to assert that he is doing things which have bad effects on his followers is a horse of a different color. And they would say, go to it. There, there is no desire to stifle Anybody? Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop there. Uh, please allow me to just clarify that I have never said that Mr. Trump is unfit for office. I have been recommending that in such situations, when one has shown evidence of dangerousness, that uh, normally we would do an examination and that an examination would be recommended. And that, uh, and I have also stated that dangerousness usually disqualifies someone from. Uh, from office because most fitness for duty exams also uh, examine one's threat to oneself or others. And uh, so I have mentioned that it's a component of the fitness for duty exam. I, I strongly uh, believe that fitness for duty is ultimately a political decision, just as disability, co uh, competence, and uh, unfitness in Do general legal? are legal decisions, yeah. yes. Yeah. So we simply add our medical assessment and recommendations. So numerous people in this book have said that he is not fit for duty. Uh, Lance Dotis uh, went on record in the paper and in his chapter. You may uh, say that you have not, and why don't we 
bypass that, but it is clear that multiple people uh, in that book have said, in the absence of actual knowledge, that he is not fit for duty. And I, I think that's damaging to the mental health professions. Uh, it seems like we could avoid kind of this discussion um, based on what you said about the inciting people to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. If people could interview some of those people in a professional manner and find out, you know, what inspired them to be violent, then it takes the pressure, then you are actually dealing with a person and you can provide documented evidence, it takes the pressure off you in terms of whether you should comment or not, and, and provides illustrations of how it's impacting, or somebody does a major study of these people and says this kind of language, which we can then link to the president, is causing you know, people in this country to commit you know, hate crimes and other sorts of things against people. So it would seem one way out of this. Well, Jim and I have always approached dangerousness and violence from a public health perspective. Exactly. And I have made clear that the personal mental health of the president is not of concern to us, but rather whether uh, he, uh, whether there is a general uh, atmosphere that encourages violence and, and increased rates of violence by virtue of the situation, which is right. Mr. Trump in the office of the presidency, not Mr. Trump himself. And the reason why I, fo uh, I call the Goldwater Rule more technical rule refers to its interpretation that, um, uh, that it's taken out of context, out of, uh, uh, we consider less the principle uh, that it falls under, which is to participate in activities that improve uh, uh, the, the community and public health. And uh, by simply interpreting the, the rule, the wording of the rule, and then, uh, and then stipulating that there are no exceptions to it, it does become a technical rule, rather than a, a, an ethical and moral guideline. That's, that's what I was referring to. I think that the real interesting it. cases of ethics are when there are two rules, and there seems to be a contradiction. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, that, that uh, you raise the idea that uh, clearly there are professional social responsibilities. And then there's this other rule that one should not opine about an individual absent an examination and a release. Uh, interpreting that conflict doesn't reduce the rule to being a technical one. It's what happens when you apply both rules to a specific situation. And so, uh, for instance, Jerry Post decided that his information was so important about Saddam Hussein that he would testify uh, uh, his personal opinion, his professional opinion that he had formulated for the CIA in Congress. He would talk about malignant narcissism, which he distinguished from the narcissism we see in the DSM-5. Uh, so it's not an established diagnosis, but he wanted to make clear that he thought this guy was really dangerous. Uh, both his employer and the APA thought that he should have kept quiet and uh, that uh, there were employment rules and ethical rules that uh, should have caused him restraint that's a matter that reasonable people can debate. We're doing a panel about causation at Apple. It hasn't been accepted yet, but we're hoping. And I was a little hung up on the notion of his causing violence. It seemed to me closer to the idea of an enabler. The person who sure. enables, enables an addiction sure. is sure. causing the addiction sure. that they're making it appear. So you have people with already existing racist stuff who have now become licensed to act based on an enabling Terry. Um, uh, if you listen to the testimony that's going on this morning, he's making exactly that same point. He said this is not, the man did not 
what, what he did is he enabled and required indirectly the action that Michael was taking. And it was sort of interesting to listen to because we all know that's what's happening, that he's able to remove himself from any mm -hmm. kind of violence at the same time that he's expecting it mm -hmm. from someone else. And but if, if you plead peace, he fires you. Yes. <laughs> uh, Jim, it's good to see you again. I think the last time we met you were president of the International Association of Forensic Psychiatry, and yeah. you and George Soros' foundation were trying to get all of us who were working in prisons to help train the uh, Eastern Europeans. I want to say I followed you very closely. Uh, Thank you. Very you were very much a presence Thank when you. I was at Walpole, and uh, that it was one of your book was one of the things that I some other people want to ask questions. Yes, too, so. uh, three, three principal. Yes, we we follow the good time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Three three things that that trouble me. One is in what I've read, I don't see just sticking with the assessment of dangerousness. For me, yeah, the science right. pursues the ethics. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have that. There are problems with the science, then, then I think that it's hard to talk about the ethics. So I didn't notice anything that was persuasive for me, and I do agree with the idea of, of narcissism. There was nothing in what I have read so far that has predictive validity. That's one concern. Number two is the, is the uh, real absence of historical context, and given the fact that um, and, and I mean this in a longitudinal sense. Given the fact that we're talking about personality, and personality is very much context-driven, how do we make all of our decisions on forced choice kinds of things? You're either for this or you're against this. The rhetoric on one side or the other constitutes some sort of description of causation. And this gets to language. I mean. The whole border thing is about immigrants and violence and criminal behavior going back to Taft in Nicaragua, uh, or even beyond that to Cuba and the, and the United States. We've never had an easy way to sort that out, and it's being in Walpole when you work. How do you, how do you begin to sort out who you know, is just coming over, who's going to be a coyote, who's trafficking drugs, who's an immigrant, who isn't. This, it's such a morass that, that the split, the forced choice around which a lot of this debate takes place, fits a democracy, but it doesn't fit the I mean, I the violence. Minute, we'll do a bunch of other people. Can yes, and I, I, I've Please got go that ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Please yeah. answer. Yeah. And then I can go to this next. Oh. Mm -hmm. well, let, me, let me say another thing. In public health, uh, and when it comes to making predictions about epidemiological outcomes, that is changes in the rates of, say, homicide or suicide in a population, people often refer to the contrast between risk factors and protective factors. And I would agree, I think that's probably, rather than speak in terms of causation, uh, I would speak in terms of risk factors and protective factors. We know what, I mean, uh, I, I wrote a book called Why Some Politicians Are More Dangerous Than Others, in which I use that concept to, uh, to point out, for example, uh, when the unemployment rate goes up, rates of suicide and homicide go up. When the unemployment rate goes down, rates of suicide and homicide go down. That's the data we have going back to 1900. So we have 115 years of data. And the, you know, you can, I, you can draw a chart I did, you know, for my book. Um, again, it's not a one-to-one -one causal relationship, but there is such a thing as risk factors, and we can we can identify those. I would agree that we're we're still at the, the kind of primitive infancy of really beginning to understand violence and, and predicting it. On the other hand, I think there's a lot of difference between at least raising raising these questions. That's what I'm trying to do. I, I agree that reasonable people can disagree. I just think I would like to get this on the radar screen of people so they can they can, they can think about it. I, I, if I may, I, I would also add that we're not attempt, trying to do an individual violence risk assessment here. 
yeah. uh, that we are thinking more in terms of probability and prevention and our knowledge of public health risk factors to violence. And we also did a study over the course of 115 years of, uh, of the political party of the president and rates of violent deaths. And uh, remarkably, over the span of this period, um, violent deaths, uh, in other words, homicides and suicides, have gone up, nearly doubled with each Republican administration, and uh, halved with each Democratic administration, without exception, except for two, which we could uh, explain with their policies. And that is, uh, while um, canceling out the factors of unemployment, and uh, economic development. And uh, so we weren't sure what that factor was. Rhetoric could be an example, but, but that is an, a phenomenon that we observe through rigorous statistical testing. Yeah, no, Bert, I think, is next. He's been waiting for patiently. Yeah, sure. uh, my name is Burton Chandler, and I appreciate being here. <laughs> Unlike uh, all of you, I have no psychiatric uh, background or degrees or anything like that. I'm a lawyer. Uh, and uh, I sit around and uh, watch television like everybody else and read the newspapers. And uh, my little talk here will involve some terms that to you people will be absolutely silly. Like I know enough to get up in the morning and say, I think our president's nuts, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not really bothered at all by these technicalities that you people are, are discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I listen here, I, I think to myself that I hear all kinds of intelligent discussions as to how you define mental illness and that sort of thing, but nobody has mentioned, and what do you do after you come to that uh, decision? So, so if I may for a moment, uh, I'm sitting around time after time, and I'm listening to this guy on the television, and uh, I say, I think the guy is crazy, and there must be some way of getting him out of office, because really, uh, if you came to a conclusion that he had a mental illness, if you got all, over all the other professional hurdles and things and, that you are obviously all hung up with, uh, what are you gonna do about it? Uh, so I checked around a little bit and I found something called the 25th Amendment. Right. Okay? Now, the 25th Amendment uh, is uh, essentially, I, I have some copies of it here. Uh, and, uh, it essentially says that whenever the vice president and a majority of the cabinet uh, send uh, a um, declaration to both houses of Congress, the president instantly is saying that he is unfit, uh, and they describe it a little bit. And there's a very serious point, I think. I think the description uh, of unfit for office would include mental unfitness for office. Uh, and um, when they get the declarations from uh, uh, the vice president and the uh, uh, cabinet, automatically, you know, automatically, he ceases to be president. Okay, uh, and uh, he is going to like that. And uh, one way of handling your problem, by the way, as to whether he's mentally fit, is to send him a little letter saying, would you mind having us mentally examine you to see whether we think, all right? And you know he's not gonna do that. Yeah, of course. It's not be comic routine. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, where do you go from there? Uh, I look up and I find out that the word declaration uh, does not mean a sworn affidavit that says, I personally believe that uh, he is nuts. Uh, and therefore, there's kind of a lot of precedent that says um, that when you don't give a standard to the vice president and the cabinet members, that um, uh, ordinary, uh, what the ordinary man would say, okay? Mm -hmm. So I say to myself, and incidentally, the statute itself, uh, the amendment itself, would seem to indicate that the party plaintiff is any one of us or some guy off the street who walks into an office and hires a lawyer, and there he is. And he doesn't have to sit, get the permission of Congress. He doesn't get permission of any human on earth. The lawyer drops a, uh, what I would call a writ of mandamus. Have any of you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. A writ of mandamus is a very solid piece of law. And it goes back for a long time. 
Uh, it's not often used, but it's very respected in the rule of law. And um, if the lawyer and the client wanders into a federal court and files for a writ of uh, ban, uh, writ of mandamus to order the um, vice president and the um, members of cabinet to file the declarations, they have to do it. Okay, they can appeal it, they can do it, you know, but before we get on, they have to do it. You don't have to do it. And if they don't do it, you go into contempt of court, you'll end up in jail, okay? Uh, similarly, that's section four. Section three of the amendment, 25, is that if the president is sitting around and thinking to himself, uh, hey, look, uh, I think I'm losing it, and I don't think I'm fit for job anymore. I'm going to send a declaration to both houses of Congress and tell them that for a while I don't think I can handle it. Automatically, he loses his job. Well, he knows that. But he hasn't done that. Everybody's stonewalling it. Um, now, one way of handling this situation is to get a lawyer and a client, and hopefully uh, would be in the District of Columbia, because that's the easiest place to get service of process on the Vice President and the members of Congress, the members of the uh, Cabinet. And within a few days, you're going to be in front of a, a federal judge. Uh, and so I wrote a book about it, okay, and here it is. Um, I send copies of the books to a lot of very eminent people because I don't have a publisher for it. Uh, and uh, you'll be happy to know that Professor Dershowitz has not had a courtesy of responding, nor has Professor Tribe, nor has Professor anybody except you, I think, who responded. Uh, and, uh, and I read your book. I read your book before I wrote my book. Uh, and I spoke to uh, several of the people in your book I'd like to autograph you, please. And uh, I really don't remember names. I should have made recollections, recollections of who they were. You will have to stop in a few minutes. What? You need to stop in a few minutes. So I want Jim and Ben to Well, let me just finish this thing. Uh, and uh, I think it would be no difficulty obtaining uh, some decent psychiatrists, two or three of them, who will violate the uh, ethics rule of the, uh, the Society of uh, Psychiatrists. And I think if we get a, uh, a couple of pollsters, um, they can all go to federal court and say to the judge, in our professional opinion, um, he's, uh, he's nuts. And the pollster would say that the majority of the medical uh, people in the country think that, the, um, that there's a problem here. And um, it is sent to Congress. And Congress has 21 days to determine whether the guy is nuts or not. Let me just say that. I've tried to be clear from the beginning, I think Ben has too, that we certainly recognize that the question of whether Trump's going to remain in office or not is a political question. It's not a psychiatric question. I don't give a damn. It's a legal. I'm a lawyer. Yeah. i got a client. Yeah. I want to win the case. No, I'm but serious. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah. No, I'm not arguing with you. Serious. I'm I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying... You've got to give them but, time to respond. But I think it's a legal and political... It, will, it involves law and your, politics, no. not psychiatry, and I think that's what you're saying. I'm saying that's what I'm saying too, and we are... We're saying, yes, all we can do is give some ideas, but ultimately the, these issues have to be decided by people in Congress or his cabinet mm -hmm. or the judiciary and so forth. That's, it's not for, we're not going to, we're not in a position, nor should we be, to, to decide whether Trump's going to remain in office or not. So um, I interviewed a friend of mine who's a former neo-Nazi leader who's left and is helping people get out, and he explicitly said that at the election of Donald Trump, it was a dog whistle to all the white supremacists, etc. and therefore mm. Southern Poverty Law Center recently yeah. said there was this increase. My question is really about law and incitement to do violence, and my, oh, my understanding is the UK passed a law against the cleric that was inciting people to do suicide bombing, mm -hmm. and they made it a crime to incite mm -hmm. violence, and I guess I want to just raise that question of what you yeah. think about that. Yeah. Well, we're here to listen. Well, again, I would certainly put that at the least as, as a risk factor. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, and another example that I give in my uh, uh, chapter in this book was that Trump, uh, in about 1989, paid eighty-five thousand dollars to put advertisements in New York City's four major newspapers, urging 
that five African American young men be given the death penalty because they had been convicted of the rape of a woman in Central Park. He did that again later and advocated again for the death penalty after DNA evidence and a confession by a serial rapist made it very clear that these five boys were innocent. They had been wrongly convicted. Trump was still saying that they should be given the death penalty. He now is the chief law enforcement officer in the United States. He's the boss of you know, the, 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 the enforcement part of, of our government. Uh, enough said. Jim and I have both been consulting with the World Health Organization, which views violence as an ecological problem. In other words, the individual contributions are relatively small compared to the social, cultural, economic, and societal factors. And so we need to take all of those into consideration. And from based on our studies, you can almost predict uh, whether or not violence levels will rise or fall based on uh, the larger societal factors, whereas with individuals, well, it's very hard. Well, he did a question. Go ahead, you go to the last question. Pick up on your last point about the the um, social determinants that you're talking about. Uh, I think I think we've got two very different domains here that are more usefully separated and blurred. One is, as Jim started with, the clinical psychiatric assessment judgment gets into all these questions, but the other is really the question of social psychology. And I think we've got a couple of handicaps here. One is, I think a lot of us would contend that psychiatry has become much less socially determined, much more individual-centric mm -hmm. in the last 50 years. And I just recall how many of us knew that the Sand Schwartz phenomenon was really, really big. Today's graduates don't know anything about that right. or about other contextual influences. And we go back to Durkheim and we think, I'm impressed that you've got the data you have to say, um, both in terms of prestige, in terms of ease of understanding, in terms of reimbursement, clinical psychiatry is up here compared to public health dimensions that we're talking about. Sure. And I think we just have to keep that in mind through these discussions. Mm. Well, I'd like to thank our guests for coming. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great deal to think about. Uh, now the yeah. critical step before us now is not to impeach Mr. Trump, but to put the chairs back where they came from. <laughs> well, can I raise one more point here? I'm not quite sure how this, this group works, but uh, Trump, uh, with his little tweets and spikes and everything else, uh, he insults dictators and tyrants and everything else. And there are places in this world in which the uh, Respect for human life is a lot less than what we have here. Yeah. And I'd certainly like to know what this group would feel if he uh, hit somebody the wrong way in some country nowhere, and the next morning we didn't wake up because we were A-bombed. Okay? Yeah. So think about your responsibilities there, because I haven't picked up a single thought here. We'll take you people today in which you've gone that far. I mentioned that in my chapter. It's in the chapter. I have that yeah. article it's which says yeah. that it's out of the case. Well, that being the case, I think 